Okay, I know instantly what you guys might be thinking. Necrogoth, what in the goddamn goddamn is this? Well, I figured since the channel is growing, I might as well spice things up a bit. I want to try my hand at becoming one of those game reviewers that have some weird made up backstory that only serves to be irrelevant, unnecessary fluff at the start of every video. As of right now, the only thing you need to know is that I used to be a normal skin covered man until I sold my soul to Satan for immortality. Which, unbeknownst to me, came at the cost of almost all my skin getting scorched off by unholy hellfire and being banished to the pits of hell forced to review indie games for all eternity. Joke's on him, I actually like indie games. It would've been much worse if I had to touch the new AAA games that have been coming out recently. Oh, uh, keep that on the down low, I'd want the big L to find out about that. You know, when I wanted immortality, I didn't imagine myself being the butt of some sick joke for that red bastard's amusement. I thought I'd be surfing on the lake of fire hanging out with his homies, but nope, no one down here gets that kind of hospitality from him besides that dumbass son of his Lucius. I mean, he loves the boy so much, he used the satanic black magic to mind control a whole studio to make a game trilogy about him. Now if you can't tell by the title and thumbnail of this video, we won't be talking about the recent third installment. Because even if this is Satan's biggest crowning achievement, he still makes his guests pay top dollar to try it out. And I only get paid one goat a year for doing this shit. <laughs> Lucius One, a product of the Finnish studio Shiver Games and released on this very fine day. It is a horror adventure game, as the studio's PR manager Kloss likes to put it, that strives to have an atmosphere that is a culmination of all the classic horror films like The Omen, Exorcist, and Shining. The game opens up on 6, 6, 6, 6. Oops, that's one extra, Satan, buddy, I don't think you looked at your calendar right. All jokes aside, this opening cutscene is an absolute banger. I only ever really played Lucius 2 previously, so when I got around to this, I was honestly really stoked to see what's in store after watching this. It's eerie, it's suspenseful, it's got such a good energy to it. After starting a new game, the story fast forwards a few years to Lucius' 6th birthday, because of course what other fucking number would it be? His mom commands him to help the maid out with the dishes and gives out the usual in bed no later than 10. God, it's the boy's birthday, let him celebrate a little. In the kitchen, Lucius gets possessed by Lucifer, which when you think about it, it was kinda bound to happen, I mean his mom is making him do chores on his own birthday. After literally slamming the door so hard it roars across the damn house, Lucifer gives you that smug, you know what to do look. This is your very basic tutorial. The game teaches you that with your little fingers you could pick stuff up and interact with most of the environment around you. Your first mission is to pick up a padlock and shut the freezer door as the maid is still in there. Lock her up, fiddle around with the temperature dials, and walk away as she dies a very cold death. Then Lucius goes to bed as if he didn't just brutally murder a helpless old maid. This is pretty much the entire game. You go around killing all members of your family and household in little devious ways. Holy fuck, the house is on fire! Oh wait, no, it's just Lucifer. Here to explain the inventory system, which Jesus Christ, for a game released in 2012, it is so clumsy and outdated. I'm pretty sure we had the basic inventories that we all know today already set up way before this. So I have no idea why for some reason they make you navigate through this by scrolling with your mouse wheel. You can also combine certain items in your inventory, in this case it's putting batteries in the flashlight. How you go about doing this isn't confusing at all, it's just with how the controls are set up it feels really awkward. I know these small inventory tweaks don't sound that bad, but you just have to play the game to know what I'm talking about. It feels really counterintuitive and weird. Lucifer also introduces you to the journal here. It's a little guidebook that helps you with your devilish missions. Speaking of which, you're given a new one here. You gotta go retrieve the padlock you left on the freezer door because Lucifer warns you that it could be a dead giveaway for Lucius' family to find out who killed the maid. As if they can't ask Lucius what happened to her that night because, you know, he was the last one to be with her. The next morning, Lucius' mom finds out about the dead maid. You're introduced to Detective McGuffin here to try and solve the supposed freak accident and Lucius' dad, Charles Wagner. He's running for an election. The death of the maid might make his campaign a little rocky, so he invites his alcoholic campaign manager Gene to come over to keep the press off the case. He's also, unfortunately, Lucius' next victim. Finally, we get some beefy main gameplay. You have this entire estate to explore, well, most of it for now. There's a lot of rooms that are locked, but as you go further into the game, those rooms eventually unlock themselves. Also, if you manage to bump into Lucius' mom while you're goofing off, she'll give you some more additional chores. Completing these will increase your good boy status, which if it's high enough you'll actually get some rewards out of it. Like the Ouija board which gives you a riddle at the start of every day, and or the creme de la creme tricycle to help you traverse through this McMansion. But let's stick to the task at hand here. Let's see what the journal wants us to do with good old Gene. He visits my father sometimes for business. I hate when he smokes in the dining room. Gives me a headache. Nice. Now what do you want me to do with that information? He is an alcoholic, so maybe I can grab a bottle and smash it over his head? 
No, that doesn't really work. Do I start some sort of fire with the cigarettes or something? I don't know what to fucking do here. <coughs> Alright, Google, help me out here. Huh. Well, first thing I gotta do is take a screwdriver from this lamp fixer man. Despite the fact that he looks like he'll very much need it for whatever he's doing, he can't be fucked to give enough of a shit if you take it right in front of his eyes. Same thing goes for Gene, you take his matches right in front of him so he can't light his cigarettes anymore. You have to run over to the kitchen, equip the screwdriver, and interact with the oven to turn it on. Now Gene stumbles over to the oven to light another dart only to get a face full of gas and fire, resulting in yet another accident at the Dante Manor. Alright, kind of off to a rocky start, but maybe the second mission isn't going to be so bad. Lucifer wakes you up in the middle of the night again to introduce you to your first of many supernatural abilities, which is telekinesis. You can pick shit up with your mind, fiddle with electronic devices from afar, and break stuff. Our next target is Ivor the Lamp Fixer. From MacGuffin's monologue right before this, you get told that Ivor will be working in the bathroom at the lower west wing. This time, we're not going to get any help from Google. We're doing this all on our own. Alright, journal, tell me what you got. Janitor Ivor. He's always drunk. He probably won't notice if I change his plans up a bit. Okay, that's... that's a little better. What you're supposed to do is pick up the pencil that's right next to you and interact with this plan book. The game will say that you wrote, fix the piano. Now you can't do anything with the piano just yet. You have to loosen its bolts with one of Ivor's wrenches. Then he will shortly come over and try to fix the piano, only to get smushed by it from your telekinetic powers. It sounds rather straightforward, but with the sheer amount of things they can interact with, it doesn't help narrow things down at all, especially since the game is very adamant about doing things the way it's intended. And that's the biggest problem with Lucius. You might think you're in this big open sandbox where you're free to go about the missions in your own little messed up way, especially since you're in this big open mansion. But that facade quickly fades away when you realize the game does very little to reward you when you take the time to explore. So in actuality, you're really playing this over-glorified point-and-click adventure, disguising itself as a sandbox with some of the most confusing and vaguest hints that will have you questioning whether or not you have room temperature IQ. The chapter titled Holy Day Slip taking place on Christmas Day has you learning your second supernatural ability the night before, which is mind control. Now with that, you might think, oh, I just learned this ability, I'm probably gonna end up using it for this mission. Spoiler alert, this doesn't happen at all. The journal tells you that Alistair the butler will be your target for the day, since he's going to be moving in and out of the crowd a lot, and perhaps you'll catch him outside. The Ouija board will tell you my forms can be many, my uses can vary, but when I'm solid, I might be slippery. Now obviously that's ice, and it's even further proven when you bump into Alistair because he'll warn you about the ground being slippery. With that, I was inclined to believe I had to find some icy patch of ground to mind control him and have him walk right into it. Then have him slip and bust his soft spot open. But as I've said previously, you for some reason don't use your mind control here at all despite the fact that you've just learned it. Okay, my other guess would be to get some water and spill it on the ground. So I get a cup, run over to the sink, and as it turns out, it doesn't even fucking work. Here's what you actually do. You go to your room, pick up Lucius's very special hydro flask made only for this specific occasion because you don't use it in any other part of the game that's just been sitting on his top shelf. No one would ever be able to figure this out. It just looks like a regular mundane prop that blends in with everything around it. You'd literally have to have your cursor accidentally lined up to it for a solid 10 seconds so you could see that's something you can pick up. And then you can fill it up with water and make some ice. Why can't it just be anything that can hold liquid? Why does there have to be a special item that the game never even bothers telling you about? It becomes less of a difficult puzzle that really makes you use your noggin and more of just trying to figure out what exactly the game wants you to do. And in cases like these, it is near impossible to do this on your own without looking at a walkthrough, just because the game does such a shit job at trying to guide you. <coughs> Honestly, I have to say the gameplay is fucking abysmal. Pretty much after the second mission, I knew I was just going to be constantly lost and confused, and that is exactly what happened. Best part about it is that I still had to sit through 17 more chapters. About the only thing I can really praise is the story. It didn't quite grab me at first, especially with some of the generic character names like Antonio, Charles, Tom. Like, they really named a dude Detective McMuffin. However, as you go from chapter to chapter, you see this very huge family fall apart from all these happy little accidents. Desperately trying to figure out what's going on, and in Charles' case, it's to protect his campaign from being tainted with all these deaths. When the mastermind behind it all is Lucius, who they don't even suspect that it's him until the very end when the whole family is reduced to single digits. For such a tiny little game made by such a tiny little studio, it's got a surprisingly meaty story. I'm not even kidding, if they touched up on the animations, voice acting, and replaced all the gameplay segments with just more cutscenes, I'd happily watch this as like a movie or something. The story is even complete with its own twist. Eventually, you learn that Lucius's grandfather Fabius is not only an ex-mob boss, but he's also a part-time Satanist. 
practicing his rituals in this hidden underground chamber beneath the house. Part of the first cutscene also reveals him trying to fulfill some sort of ancient prophecy that in turn caused Lucius to be the son of Lucifer. When he starts catching on with all the shit that's happening with the family, he wakes up Lucius in the middle of the night and tells him to meet him in the underground ritual chamber. This leads into a stealth mission where you have to tiptoe around the house. This isn't actually the first one either, there's one that comes a little before Holy Day Slip, but seeing as I'm kinda skipping through this a little bit, I figured here would be the best time to talk about it. To keep these from being way too easy, a lot of the rooms are locked forcing you to find alternate paths to get to where you need to go. Now in this case, every single door besides the one that leads into the balcony is locked, so that's our only option, and it leads into the parrot's bedroom. Hmm... Journal, you've been nothing but a complete fucking dud this whole time. But maybe this time you'll share some of your almighty knowledge with me. Seems that everyone is still awake. I need to find a way to get past everyone undetected. Darkness is my friend. Well, there is quite a bit of a storm going on, so maybe when lightning strikes and the lights go out for a bit, I could try to rush my way out. And that didn't work, okay great. I may be a little stupid. There's an electrical box outside the balcony that can interact with using your telekinesis. Apologies, I didn't fucking see it because, you know, it's kind of dark as shit, but now the power in the house is out and most of the remaining families patrolling the corridors with flashlights. The stealth in this game isn't that bad, honestly. Yes, the AI has a really predictable path, but sneaking in and out of the shadows and hiding behind some of the decorations feels really fun. My only problem with that is that the NPCs walk really fucking slow. It's one thing to be able to know where they're walking to, but it's another thing to know when they're going to come out of a room that you need to go into. Since they really like to take their sweet ass time, I always second guessed myself thinking that they've already left through a different door, so I'd walk in and they'd be right in front of me. Now in situations like these, you can use the new ability that you've learned to mind wipe to quickly run past them. Don't rely on it too much however, as you can only use it a small number of times per chapter. Once you manage to scrape past all the NPCs and make it into the underground chamber, Fabius tells you to start preparing the ritual to sacrifice a reporter he kidnapped a few cutscenes ago. You gotta strap him down, arrange all the blood bowls, and... W wait, what? Oh, for fu- Okay, now that we have all the blood bowls fixed and arranged, we light the candles and let Gramps do his thing. Just kidding, we fucking stabbed the old fart to death. Unfortunately, doing that created too much of a ruckus, causing the reporter to wake up from his little nap and break free from his straps, and now we enter a little mini boss fight with this dude. He learns that the crosses that are hanging up on the wall when they're not inverted prevent Lucius from using his powers. Again, this isn't anything new and you're pretty much introduced to this at the very start of the game. I'm only bringing it up now because this is literally the only time it serves a much bigger and more significant purpose, whereas normally they're just kind of minor annoyances. Also, I gotta say, this is one of those games that really shouldn't have boss fights. This whole fight is just convoluted, you're constantly running around the room inverting crosses and spamming your new fireball attack at the reporter when you get the chance to. It feels very shoehorned, it's almost as if the devs really wanted a boss fight but couldn't really care or figure out a way to make it so it fits in. So what we're left with is whatever the fuck you'd want to call this in what is essentially a puzzle game. The next morning, it's Lucius's first day of school. In late fucking May, right when the school year is about to end in most states. Ah, uh, but you know, since Lucius is being raised by such an absurdly rich family, he has his own private classroom with his own private teacher, James. He has the privilege of taking year-long breaks without anyone giving a fuck. Alrighty then, Lucius, it's time for me and you to get those dusty brain cogs spinning again with some math and magics. Show me what you got, James. How much is one plus one plus one? One plus one plus one? <sighs> That's obviously three. Get the hell out of here with that shit, James. I didn't even use my fingers for that. How much is one plus two minus two? Lucius, buddy, I think you need a better teacher. This guy's giving you stuff for babies. How much is six minus four plus seven minus four plus five minus eight? Whew, okay, I take it back. You're one rough teacher, James. You really want to hit the ground running with that? Okay, uh, so uh, 6 minus 4 is 3, divided by 2, add 8, minus 3, divided by 2. I think it is probably most likely 3. No, that is not correct. Try again. <laughs> The next chapter is titled Peeping Tom, a rather fitting name since you have to get rid of the last maid in the house by using your telekinesis to drop a hairdryer into the tub, all the while you're looking through a perverted uncle's bathroom peephole. 
But it's not as simple as that. The mission starts with the maid doing laundry, which you have to stop her from doing so she can take a bath. How you go about doing this is quite possibly the stupidest thing I've ever done in a video game. Using your telekinesis, you have to drop an iron into the washing machine. The bad part of it is that there's two irons, one of which you can't interact with at all. Did the devs not think about how confusing this is to a player? If you're going to have two irons, make it so they can both be interacted with. Or better yet, remove the one that is completely fucking useless. I know this sounds kinda nitpicky, but come on, what's the point of having one that is interactable and one that serves no purpose other than for decoration? It's also at this point where I start to get the feeling that the devs were running out of ideas and were just trying to pad the game out. Next mission has you repeating the exact same thing so you could take Will the Mechanic out of the garage and kill Michael the family chauffeur from carbon monoxide poisoning, when you really could've just poisoned both of them, and then you kill Will in the next mission. There's not even a puzzle to solve here, you just pour gasoline over him and shoot him with a fireball. Is the gasoline even really necessary here? Like Lucius, you shoot giant fucking fireballs out of your hands. We're getting very close to approaching the end here. Charles is convinced that Lucius is behind all these deaths that have been happening around the house, while Lucius's mom Nancy thinks he's going insane. Charles goes out to gather up any evidence against Lucius, giving you the perfect opportunity to take out Nancy. Honestly, I think it's safe to say that this whole family is going insane. Nancy's outside just singing this song, but she keeps repeating the same line over and over again. God damn, you're really giving me a reason to not like you. Alright, here's what you do. Go into this crummy wooden shack, plug in the air compressor, grab the nail gun and fill it with air, then plant the nail gun next to Nancy, wait for Charles to come by so you can mind control him into shooting Nancy right in the dome. Lucius is then supervised by Deputy Terrence in this tiny room filled with crosses, while you wait for the arrival of a child psychologist. You can't do much, but you have enough power to use your telekinesis on these tiny little busts. Making them hover over the crosses makes Terrence freak the fuck out and shoot at them. Shooting a gun indoors with a child right next to you, that's a... that's a brilliant idea. Him doing this causes the crosses to be destroyed, giving you more power. Repeat this two more times until you can use your telekinesis on the big statue. Then hover it next to the ceiling fan so smartass Terrence shoots at it, causing the fan to get all fucked up. Then use your telekinesis again on the fan to decapitate him. Decapitation! Finally, the last chapter. You're given the option of choosing the action ending or puzzle ending. The action ending is pretty much the same thing as the reporter mini-boss. You spam your fireballs at the two priests that come over to exercise you, and then squish Charles under a burning pillar. Lucius heads outside and is greeted by Detective McMuffin, and the game just abruptly ends. Then you have the puzzle ending, which Jesus fucking Christ, it's so bad. Don't get misled into it thinking you're actually gonna do some puzzles. No, this is just the action ending with so many extra unnecessary steps that when all combined together make this such a clunky and dreadful mission. You start off with one priest who's trying to exercise you. He has a cross in his hand so you can't do much other than throw some furniture at him until he drops it, and then you can just throw a big ol' fireball at him. The second priest is constantly pacing back and forth from the lobby to the laundry room. Again, you can't do much, but there's a pentagram scribbled on the floor in the laundry room. Standing on top of it will activate your fireball ability again, and you have to hit him right before he leaves. If you fail to do this, you have to chase him back into the laundry room and try to hit him again before he kills you. Then you have to kill Charles, which is just a needlessly complicated process. He's chasing you around trying to whack you with a fire extinguisher. What you gotta do is use your telekinesis on the big chandelier in the lobby, and then you have to mind control him into getting distracted by a bust laying on the ground. If you manage to do this successfully, the chandelier will land on top of him and then you quickly hit him with a fireball. Like I said, this is just an action ending with extra steps that I can imagine end up being confusing and frustrating for any new player. It's especially true in this case because you can't even open up your journal here. How do they expect anyone to figure out that throwing furniture a bunch of times at the priest is what they're supposed to do? Or you know, better yet, use telekinesis on the chandelier and mind controlling Charles to get distracted by a bust. The decision to have this as an optional ending in the game completely baffles me. I don't understand why anyone, unless if it's out of morbid curiosity, would decide to go through with this ending. It's terrible. Why should I go through with this when it makes me want to rip my fucking eyes out of frustration, when I could've just done the action ending and be done with the game in like two minutes without breaking a sweat? Not to mention, the ending just sucks ass for both options. It's like they tried to end it off on an exciting cliffhanger, but it leaves me dissatisfied and feeling like my time would've been better spent if I did literally anything else. All in all, Lucius 1 gets put all by itself in E tier. Look, I thought about it for a second. Maybe that's a bit harsh, perhaps it's really more of a D tier game. And then I said, no, what the fuck? All the D tier games, while they're certainly far from perfect, have at least something going for them that made them somewhat enjoyable. Brutal Legend had its world building aesthetic which just oozes so much character and personality. Postal 4, while it feels like it completely runs on spaghetti code and has a rather soulless empty world, 
At the very least, you can tell that RWS is trying to put as much TLC into this game to make it as good as the fan favorite Postal 2 with the constant amount of updates this game gets. Lucius, on the other hand, I knew from the very moment that first mission ended that I was going in for an experience that was going to leave me with the most bitter and sour taste in my mouth. And every mission that came after that confirmed that gut feeling. I went into this thinking it was a sandbox, leaving me with multiple options to kill my victims however I want, but what I got was a puzzle game, which wouldn't be bad, but it's a fucking awful puzzle game. Every level is filled with at least one moment that will leave you feeling stuck, confused, annoyed beyond belief because this game always wants you to do something so specific and it does such a piss poor job at communicating exactly what it wants you to do. And I know I've been repeating that for this entire review, but that is literally the entire game and I don't find it to be very enjoyable. Yes, there were parts that didn't completely suck like the stealth missions, but as fun as I thought they were, honestly they're just kind of passable. And the story, while I did find it to be very good, it's not enough to carry this really mediocre game. Fortunately, I didn't run into any major bugs during any of my two playthroughs, which, if I did, I probably would have thrown Lucius into F tier along with Postal 3. Whoa, 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 hey, hey! Hold your fucking tits! We still got one more game to look at. Lucius 2 The Prophecy. Announced on August 8th, 2014 and released February 13th, 2015. With this sequel, Shiver Games promised to fix all the issues that were present in the first game, especially its linearity given that Lucius 1 wasn't very well received by most critics. So is it any good? Well, there's really only one way to find out, but I will say I did start off by playing Lucius 2 many years ago and I do think I enjoyed it quite a bit. Hopefully going back into this will be as fun as I remembered it. The game starts off by recapping the events of the first one and continuing how it left off. McMuffin throws Lucius into psychiatric evaluation, being convinced that he's most likely traumatized after his whole entire family just died. But after spending some time alone, he finally comes to the conclusion that Lucius was the mastermind behind it all. At which point he's greeted by Lucifer and Jesus Christ dude, what is wrong with your mouth? <laughs> Lucifer then goes on some never-ending spiel about some prophecy and that there's this new evil kid on the block named Isaac who's like Lucius's evil brother but not really like his biological brother and he's taking all of Lucius's rep and then plans to start the apocalypse as it's described in the book of revelations. Turns out Lucius also wants to do that to claim Lucifer's throne or something and McMuffin then sides with Lucius for some reason. Look, I don't blame him. If Lucifer spawned right behind me and started babbling about some dumb prophecy shit, I think I'd start agreeing to everything just so he'd shut the hell up. I mean, that's partially the reason why I'm down here in the first place. I really would try and give a good brief synopsis of the story, but compared to how dark, suspenseful, and captivating the first one was, this just falls flat on its face. It's so nonsensical. You're given so much backstory that's all crammed into this one cutscene, presented to you in this really ugly cardboard cutout art style. I just find it so hard to follow with anything that's being said to me. It very much disobeys the rule of show, don't tell. On top of all of that, you're also immediately thrown into a very drawn out tutorial right after it. It really just piles every new feature this game has onto you without letting you learn as you go. However, I will say I do like most of the new features that are introduced here. Not all of them are great, like the skill tree. I mean, yeah, it looks like it'd be fun, but I never find myself using any of this besides mind control and on very few occasions telekinesis. But apart from that, the inventory is back and thank fuck they've improved it so it's not clunky. And my favorite feature that is a complete game changer is the item tags. Every item now has a set of tags that very effectively tell you how it can be used. There are a lot of these tags, but there's no point in me going through all of them because they practically all speak for themselves. You've got flammable, explosive, conductible, breakable, combinable, you get the idea. There's also compelling, which if an item with this tag is dropped, it'll grab the attention of nearby NPCs. This applies to things like donuts, sandwiches, wallets, and a pack of cigs. I know it sounds basic and minor, but I really appreciate just how well it conveys so much useful information to you in a way that's super easy to understand. Compared to Lucius 1, which didn't bother telling you jack shit most of the time. After this tutorial, you're given another cutscene. Damn, what is with these games and giving you so much shit to watch? Lucius goes ham eggs and cheese on some fruit loop because of, uh things, which lands him right into shock therapy. I'm starting to think that this hospital might just be a giant medieval torture chamber. If the staff here think it's a good idea to put a 7 year old into shock therapy. I mean, I don't know, I find it to be a little extreme. Uh, but what the fuck do I know about modern medicine? If your child is acting a little stupid, a simple lobotomy should straighten them out just fine. However, none of that matters since Lucius apparently releases like a shockwave when in contact with electricity or something. 
I have no fucking idea. Finally, yet again, our first bit of actual gameplay. We're supposed to walk through this floor of the hospital in search of some clues regarding Isaac. To do this, we need to get some keys and take care of one of the first guards so we can slip past him undetected. And how would we go about doing this? Ah, well, the game tells us. We could poison his coffee, break the ceiling fan above him, or electrocute the faucet with a defib. Don't worry, the game doesn't hold your hand like this. But this is a good way of telling you not only about the most basic methods of executing your victims, but also giving you an idea of just how much you can interact with the environment around you. Almost everything you can see can serve somewhat of a purpose to you, and not a single object has gone to waste. I like to think of it as just one giant jigsaw puzzle with every object being a piece waiting to be fitted in with another piece, to ultimately become a part of some elaborate plan to take out the hospital's janitor. Of course, sometimes shit doesn't really work out the way you wanted it to, so there's no shame in sprinkling some cyanide pills on a pack of donuts for some dribbling idiot to come by and eat it off the ground. Seriously, I fucking love how much freedom you're given here. Some of these levels stretched out to be almost 30 minutes long for me, because most of the time I was just way too busy scouting around and thinking of clever ways to take out some random dude that half the time wasn't even part of the main objective, just a doofus that got caught in my line of sight at the wrong place and at the wrong time. Okay, after meeting up with some of the locals here, you learn about this town called Ludlow, which is where Isaac is hanging out and trying to start an apocalypse. Again, I hate to admit it, but I'm still completely lost as to what's going on in the story. All I do know is that Lucius' dad just so happens to be in the ICU a few floors below us. Of course, this is a problem for Lucius, knowing that his family wasn't entirely eliminated, so we gotta fix that. And we also have to call McMuffin to pick us up from the hospital. It probably would be very fitting to take care of Charles in the most brutal way imaginable, considering that he tried beating me to death with a fire extinguisher in the last game, but I'm too lazy to really think of anything like that, so I think just shutting off his life support is good enough. Alright, now we just gotta get to McMuffin, who parked his car in the morgue of all places. With just a quick car ride, we make it to Ludlow, and this is kinda where the game takes a nosedive. The game starts going back to its old habits of giving you really vague objectives without providing you with anything else. Your only objective here is to get a boobell, which I know is in this locked abandoned building, but again, it's locked, so how the fuck do I get in? The game does sort of provide you with a name to look for, which is Caleb Butler, who recently acquired the property. Now, he just so happens to be chilling in the town's diner, but here's the thing. When you kill him, he doesn't actually drop the keys to the building, because, you know, I guess that'd be too simple. So here's what you have to do next. Kill the town's mechanic and take his keys to get into his shop. You'll see Caleb Butler's to-do list on a table which tells you he had plans to go to the bank to pick up the house keys. Why the fuck are his plans in the mechanic shop that he seemingly has no relation to? I don't fucking know, but it just is how it is. You go to the bank, find out the keys are in the vault, kill the bank teller so you could get the vault keys, go into the vault, use Caleb's keys on a locker so you could get the crack house keys, Jesus Christ, why are there so many keys? And then finally get the Bible. Oh my fucking god, I would've been able to do that in like two minutes if this town just had a goddamn library. So now Lucius goes through his apocalypse plans, starting with poisoning the town's water supply by going to the water treatment plant. This level is weird. I don't know, compared to what the rest of the game had to offer, this one just feels really linear. It does start off by giving you a bunch of toys to mess around with to kill your victims, but after that, things just get a little too simple. Take for example this part. Literally this moving box is the only thing the game provides me with to get rid of two workers. It's not hard by any means, but it's just not fun. Give me options, not just one fucking box. And I know you're running through hospital floors for the entire first half of the game, but the level design here just feels exceptionally claustrophobic. There's also these puzzles where you use water to conduct electricity to an electrical box that allows you to progress further into the level. And I mean, they're interesting, but come on devs, they're not cool enough to be repeated once more. The third level has you cutting the town's power. I will say this is probably my favorite level in the second chapter. It doesn't feel linear, and it sort of forces you to be mindful of what you have in your inventory and what's at your disposal and the environment around you. Since your last objective is to mostly kill everyone, and if you don't have a whole lot stocked up in your inventory, you're really going to have to think of ways to get the most amount of kills using the least amount of resources. Unlike the last level, this strikes a good balance with limiting the things you can work with, but giving you just enough to still have fun and not feel like you're going through the same song and dance. And because of that, it does put a nice challenging twist to this whole thing. Jesus Christ. The whole place is on fire. What the hell are we gonna do? Huh, where have I heard that voice before? The penultimate level has you walking through this burning lab so you can get out into the fields and release the locusts. This mission kinda sucks. Yeah, disregard everything I've said about good item balancing, you've got fuck all to work with here for the amount of people you have to deal with. I can't be bothered. As much as I don't like having to do this, I always mind control each and every NPC and making them walk into some fire because the game practically gives you nothing here. You also bump into, uh, what's his name? Oh, 
Isaac Gilmore. Thanks for reminding me. I almost completely forgot. Now, uh, what am I supposed to do here? You learn a few cutscenes prior that Isaac is allergic to salt, so you just throw some salt that you found in the lab at him. And then there's the final showdown. Except you gotta take care of the four angels first, who are just ordinary military men. God, this part is annoying. If you've got nothing helpful in your inventory, you have to deal with them by busting open fire hydrants and having the lid fly right into their kneecaps. The problem with this is that there's only three hydrants and four of them. If you miss your shot, well, you could only pray that you'll get two of the angels to line up for one more, otherwise you're really just shit out of luck. There is also a defib you can use, but you can only use it once, so keep that in mind. Finally, the fight with Isaac. You're probably going to run around like an idiot at first. Don't worry, I found myself in the exact same situation twice already. Seriously, what happened during the second half of the game? First half I was given clear, easy to understand objectives and now it's like the devs fell asleep and couldn't be bothered to provide us with some proper directions. What you have to do is pull out a pair of pliers and bust open this fire hydrant so it hits this nurse. This causes her to drop the shotgun in her hand so you can grab it and load it up with salt shells which are a little bit in front of her. Then shoot at Isaac, reload, shoot, rinse and repeat and he's dead. Well that was a lot of fun. So Lucius 2, is it a flop or is it a... A, a, a pop? Well, to be quite honest with you, I do think it's worthy of being put into C tier. Also fucking impeccable writing there, Necrogoth. You truly are the best. You know, after playing the first one, I was getting ready to be thoroughly disappointed by the sequel, but it really surpassed my expectations. Lucius 2 is a very fun game, and especially the first chapter, which is super enjoyable. What I can't seem to understand is this game receives pretty much the same kind of reception as the first one, and even getting 49 on Metacritic, which, how does that even happen? I find it odd too, because no matter how hard I look, I just can't find a fair legitimate negative review of this game. I see a lot of people say that it isn't fun because you can just poison donuts and kill NPCs like that, and while to that I say, no shit it's not fun if that's the only thing you're doing, you're actually going out of your own way to suck the fun out of this game. The poison donuts are best used as a last resort when you're stumped but other than that, look around you. You'll find about a dozen fun ways to kill someone if you think hard enough. And okay, the AI isn't anything stellar and they're about as dumb as a sack of bricks, but personally, I didn't find that to be a very huge issue. Even though I might be in the minority here when I say this, but I really do think Lucius 2 is a very huge improvement from 1. If the second chapter felt a little more consistent, and if the game had a much more grounded story like the first, then maybe this could have been pushing up to an A, but... That's not the case. Although the Lucius series doesn't end here. As I've said in the beginning of this video, this is now a trilogy with a third installment that apparently has an open world, so I'm very interested to find out how that's like. But you know, I can't play it until Satan decides to give me a pay raise. Or better yet, he pulls his head off his ass and finally realizes no one really does barter economies anymore. Seriously, what the fuck am I gonna do with a goat? Apparently Google tells me these things sell for like $500 at least, but where am I gonna sell this piece of sh- I don't think there's a single living soul that lives within an 800 mile radius of me because I live on a stupid fucking island. Come along children, now we're going to have a little music, like old times.